mid-1960s, the most celebrated team in American sports was the Green Bay Packers. Ten future members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame had led the pack to three world championships in the five years before the first Super Bowl. Although playing in the league's smallest town, the Packers were treated like royalty wherever they went, and their coach was, arguably, America's most recognized public figure. This is Vince Lombardi, coach of the finest football team in the world, the Green Bay Packers. The big word in professional football is execution. All players succeed on the blackboard, but men make them work. I'm sure I speak for every player on our club uh, and every person that has been on our club through the years that was exposed to Coach Lombardi when I tell you that we're better people for having been exposed to him. The preparation that is necessary in order to succeed, the, the total commitment to practice and, and teamwork, all of these things are qualities that are so essential to success today that without them you cannot be successful and with them uh, you cannot fail. This gentleman was uniquely well prepared and well organized it was a joy to be in meetings with him, not only on the field, watching him demonstrate or illustrate a point, but in meetings, the way he taught. Gentlemen, this is the most important play we have. It's the play we must make go. It's the play that we will make go. And it's the play that we will run again and again and again. Lombardi's words could also pack a wallop outside the classroom. What are you doing? I'll tell you something, Leroy, you're not going to get your job back unless we get a better performance. He has a temper. I think he's very fiery in everything that he does. And, a, and a, I have been one player who especially have tried to stay out of that uh, realm of where usually it irritates him most. When he hollered at me, it disrupted me very badly. I think he knew that it, it just almost was like... It was almost the same as hitting me. And, and you know, I, I, I think we played out of fear. Avoiding Lombardi's wrath wasn't limited to just the Packer players. As rookie Bill Curry discovered in 1965 when his flight was canceled the night before training camp opened. And I asked for the manager of North Central Airlines. Told me I'd be on the next flight out, which was the next morning, and I was going to be 12 hours late for Vince Lombardi, or worse. So I decided my only hope was to inform him of that. So I said, I just want you to understand this. I'm going to be late for my very first meeting with Vince Lombardi. It's your fault. It's North Central Airlines' fault, and I'm going to be sure that the coach knows that. The gentleman had my bag pulled from the airplane. I'm not making this up either. He leased a single-engine plane, carried my bag to the plane, had me flown to Manitowoc, where I was met by a North Central van and was driven to the Green Bay Packer training camp at St. Norbert College 15 minutes early. <laughs> that was my first taste of the Lombardi mystique. The Lombardi mystique was nothing compared to the man himself. I hated his guts. I, um... I didn't like anything about the way he coached the team. Uh, Donka said no, you'll have to get him. I can't. He said you're not ready. I don't know what he means by that. He had the reputation of going to church every day. I didn't believe it, so I went to Bart Starr. I said, Bart, tell me the truth. There's no way the coach goes to church every day. He said, oh, no, he goes to church every day. He goes to Mass every single morning. But, Bill, there's something you need to realize. When you've been working with this man about three weeks, you're going to realize this man needs to go to church every day. I don't know what the hell happened. I said it was against Zeke. It should have been great. So nobody nobody blocked on the left side. Marvin, you miss that guy every time. There were certain players that he would just descend upon. I mean, he would just jump all over Jerry Kramer, Jimmy Taylor, me. Oh, come on. Get off the ball down the field. Jeez, you cut everything off. I mean, it would just infuriate me that he would say things like that. And I found out years later when I was a coach, he was right. He was right about all of it. But I couldn't handle it. I was too immature. The rest of the Green Bay roster was far more experienced, especially in the backfield. It had been veterans Jim Taylor and Paul Horning 
who had carried the Packers to the 1965 league title. This was a game in which it was clearly evident that the strength of our team was in our running game. The field was in tough condition. We'd had some snow. It was not good for a passing game. When you have Horning and Taylor in the backfield behind you, they were fabulous. Star takes the ball, hands off to Horning. Sweep to the left side. He's got the block. He's inside the 10. He's got the five. Cuts into the end zone for the touchdown. The game is over. The Green Bay Packers are the National Football League champions. The Packers won with Taylor and Horning hoisting the team on their shoulders. But changes were coming as Green Bay prepared to defend its crown in 1966. During the mid-60s, the NFL found itself in a frenzied fight with the American Football League over blue-chip college athletes. As the season wound down in 1965, Coach Lombardi told us, look, we're in a bidding war with the other league. We're going to have to go after some people. There was <laughs> some heavy recruiting uh, because it was fierce competition with the AFL. But we were fortunate to get two top picks. I think the Packers hoped that they would get either Donnie Anderson or Jim Grabowski, and they offered both a ton of money. When they ended up getting both of them, that was like a bonus. I think with Grabowski and Donnie Anderson, that had the potential to really be very destructive for the Green Bay Packers because there were not too many veteran players that was happy about seeing these guys get the money. It was still, they have not played a down for Green Bay. And I've been here uh, you know, six, seven years, and i played my heart out, and yet uh, I can't make that kind of money. Typically of individuals, I'm sure that there were some who were oh, somewhat skeptical. I think most everyone recognized that, hey, this is a change in times. This is what's happening today. Move on, let's have these guys be great assets. And that's more of what we saw than anything else. Even Donnie, with his cocksure attitude, was humble when he was around the veterans. He knew when to shut his mouth. The only time I think they pushed the envelope a little bit is we had a rookie show every year. And it was a rookie's job to entertain the veterans. And, and Donnie, I think, had the idea. They got cigars, and they lit the cigars with dollar bills uh, that were on fire. And I'm not sure the veterans appreciated that little bit of humor. One such veteran was Jim Taylor, a man who approached his profession with a blunt and confrontational attitude. I feel like that uh, I'm going to make the tackler respect me, and I'm going to punish him. I'm going to hit the tackler harder than he's going to hit me. That combative nature that made Taylor great carried over to the negotiating table. I think most of us would say, yes, sir, if we'd been offered a bonus or, or, or an increase or something, um, I'm happy to have it. Not Jim. No, he was more blunt. He needed this and so forth. This is what he felt he deserved. According to the lore around the locker room, Taylor's going upstairs to talk to the old man, and it's going to be a war because Jimmy wouldn't back down. Jimmy was not intimidated by Vince Lombardi. Taylor's battles with Lombardi had just begun, and he wasn't conceding ground to the rich Packer rookies either. Backfield mate Paul Horning was also conditioning himself for the competition. Probably was in the best shape of my entire career uh, by the time the first game opened. Um, Lombardi had me running the steps. I ran the stadium steps three times a day. I probably was quicker at the beginning of the year than I ever had been in my life. By summer's end, Taylor and Horning had secured their customary spots in the starting lineup. Following a win on opening day, the two old pros rescued the Packers from certain defeat at Cleveland. Now we're back to play the same team that a year ago had played us for the world championship, and they came out of the gate so fast, and they jumped on us 14 to nothing as if it were child's play. The Browns dominated until Horning and Taylor trickery changed the momentum. 
We faked this ball to Taylor, so he's going to try to get the first down. This defensive end comes charging in there toward me. Taylor takes him right out. It's, it's like a big lineman taking him out. Paul is literally all alone running down the sideline. So it was real easy to just flip right out there to Paul and let him run for a touchdown. Down by six late in the game, the Packers gambled with a surprising play call. The reason that we ran this is that Jim came back to the huddle and said, Bart, uh, they're ignoring me outside. If I could get him out in the flat there, he could beat them and get into the end zone, which was quite a task that far out. And now it is fourth down and eight for the Green Bay Packers. And Jimmy Taylor is on the receiving end now if he can get home. He gets by Feetner. And he pile drives his way by E. Rich Barnes and is in for the Packer touchdown. And what a brilliant comeback by the world champion Packers. Taylor and Horning had done it again though neither knew then that their fortunes were about to change. Through the first half of the regular season, Green Bay's defenders dominated their opponents. There were several things that made the 66 season special for the defense. We came together as a group and said, you know, our offense might struggle, but one of the things we're going to do, we're going to keep the score such that we will always be in the game. We really believe that in the final analysis, we would win the game if we had to. Led by Davis, number 87, the defense scored two touchdowns of its own in a win over Atlanta. Midway through their schedule, the Packers were 6-1. and one. But another big story of the day was the first meaningful appearance of Green Bay's Gold Dust Twins. This is Donnie Anderson, the highest price rookie in football history. And Mr. Anderson shows you why Green Bay paid so much money for him. During the game, Donnie Anderson just looked sensational, which everybody had kind of been waiting for. Jim Grabowski ran the ball extremely well. So the two young Turks looked like they were poised to begin to take over. A frustrated Jim Taylor could no longer remain silent. And here he is with competition, coming to his house, trying to take his job, no matter what his name is, Jim Grabowski or Joe Smith. And he's already being paid a bunch more than this guy that has given his heart to an organization for a decade and is one of the great players of all time. Why wouldn't Jimmy Taylor be upset? How could he not be? And Jimmy Taylor decided to use that day to publicly say, I'm out of here. I will not be here unless these people reward me like I deserve to be rewarded. He was going to leave. And he made that abundantly clear, and he did it in a public way, and I think Coach Lombardi bridled at that. Lombardi and Taylor rarely spoke to each other the rest of the season. Their once cordial relationship had been damaged beyond repair. He felt that Jimmy Taylor was kind of sulking and, and just not putting out, and, and he really went off. He said... Jimmy Taylor, I don't know what I'm going to do with him. He's just so rebellious. And you know, even though he had been a player extremely important to our success, I don't think there was a guy on the team probably didn't anticipate Jimmy going. Jimmy was at the end of his run at Green Bay. Star absolutely was the best player, the best quarterback ever that Green Bay could have had. He would run the offense in such a confident and intelligent way that you had to respect Bart for what he did. 
Bart managed to do everything that was necessary to make the Packers win. A lot of people said Bart Starr would never make it in professional football. They said his arm wasn't strong enough and uh, he didn't uh, throw the ball as well as the other quarterbacks. Bart Starr, over the period of years, has proved to be probably the most exceptional, accurate passer in professional football. His record stands alone in that category. And I was an overachiever. I recognize that. I've told people that Brett Favre could throw the ball better on his knees and I could stand him. And, and I mean, he, he could. But I was blessed with a great team. And I've reflected on that numerous times. But uh, yes, in 1966, it was probably the best season that I ever individually enjoyed. I had come from a military family. Because of that, I was probably a little on the, uh, the meek, mild side as a result of my father <laughs> pushing us down all the time. But Starr possessed more than enough backbone to go to bat for his teammates when necessary. Bart was the only player that I ever saw, and Bart doesn't like to talk about this, and he's uncomfortable even talking with me about it to this day, but he would stand up in front of the team and he would say, wait a minute, coach, don't be criticizing us about that because that's not true. Let's get it right. And Coach Lombardi would actually concede to him. Bart Starr always put his teammates first. The only time he ever criticized a player in public was when tackle Steve Wright continually failed to block his man during a preseason game. And he was just stinking up the place. And a young guy who was kind of a, an a-hole, he later was uh, released, but uh, I just jumped all over him when he came back to the huddle after missing a block. Bart went up to him and said, Steve, if I see that Lloyd Voss in here one more time, he said, I'm not going to kick him, but I'm going to kick you right in the pants in front of 50,000 people. Starr was far more patient with second-year center Bill Curry. Curry had to brush up quickly when he unexpectedly found himself anchoring a veteran-laden offensive line. Bill Curry was an outstanding addition to our team. With the injury that uh, Ken Bowman suffered, uh, Bill was thrust in <laughs> quickly, but he was a fast learner. He was a great fit for us. Very, very smart. Everyone welcomed him. But in his own mind, Curry did not feel welcomed by all the factions on the team. Now here I was from College Park, Georgia, had never been in a huddle with an African-American. I wanted to be accepted, but I didn't know how. Trying to integrate into that great a team. Of course, we're, of course we're anxious, but we have the greatest defense I think ever assembled, and they always come up with a big play, always. All my life I had been taught, not by my parents, but by the culture in which I lived, that we were different and that we were better than other people. In my heart of hearts, I knew there was something wrong with that, but I didn't know quite how to articulate it or how to behave, because there was Lionel Aldridge, David Robinson, Herb Adderley, Willie Wood, and I thought that they would hear my southern accent, injure me, and send me home. And who could have blamed them? We were right in the middle of the civil rights movement. Cities were burning. Because of this tension I felt, I didn't know how to act. And uh, the most intimidating of them all was Willie Davis, the defensive captain, who was from Grambling State University, was working on his master's degree in business at the University of Chicago and shattered every racist stereotype that I had learned growing up in the South. And playing with you, you got to be, you know, the finest outside linebacker in football. And hell, having you there surely had not hurt me yeah, over these last You taught me how to play defense, baby. And I mean that from my heart. I'm walking out of the dorm one night at St. Norbert College, and this voice comes out of the darkness. Bill? It was Willie Davis. I thought it was God. I just sat out in the grass, terrified. It was Willie Davis. He said, I'd like to speak with you. And I said, oh, no, this is it. He's going to tell me to go home. And uh, I said, OK. He said, I've been watching you at practice. I think you've got a chance to make our team. And I'm going to help you. When Nitschke's snapping your face mask and breaking your nose, and Lombardi's screaming in your face, and there's blood everywhere, and you don't think you can take another step. You look at me, and I'll get you through it. 
He didn't just help me to play in the NFL for 10 years. He changed my life because I was never able to look at another human being, any human being, in the same way I had. It was an unexpected, undeserved, unrewarded act of kindness by a great leader and a great man. I've never forgotten that moment. And that is the difference in the outstanding teams and the others. If you got Willie Davis, nobody can beat you. Despite angering the Packers by going public with his salary complaints, Jim Taylor remained in the starting lineup. Backfield partner Paul Horning was not so fortunate. As I watched him through the year, you could see not the decline of his desire or of his engagement with the team, but literally the physical deterioration in one of his shoulders. Paul was the ultimate consummate football player. He did everything. Heisman Trophy when it comes to Green Bay, he can pass, he can run, he can block, kick, and he suffered this injury that year, and I'm sure it had to be devastating for him to have to step back and sit and watch because he was a competitor. Horning saw virtually no action during the final two months of the 66 season when championship hopes were threatened by a rare home loss to the Vikings. following week, Bart Starr injured his leg in the first quarter against arch-rival Chicago, forcing Green Bay to turn to backup Zeke Rutkowski. We hated to lose Bart because he was the best quarterback in the business, but Zeke was just as good. It was amazing. Zeke was always ready, and that's very difficult to do. A pair of Bretkowski touchdown passes to Carroll Dale were just enough to beat the Bears. A week later, in a rematch against Minnesota, Green Bay's defensive captain responded with the game of his life. I walked on that field that day saying, I don't care what happens, but I'm going to get Fran talking to the day, and he's not going to run around and embarrass me the way he has in some of the previous games. If I catch Fran Talkington, I'm going to do something bad to it. Davis sacked Talkington four times. Then the outcome was resolved by Green Bay's fullback of the future, Jim Grabowski. could now clinch the Western Conference title and a berth in the NFL championship game with a win at Baltimore. But a slim fourth quarter lead was in jeopardy as Johnny Unitas drove the Colts downfield. And I'm thinking, oh my God, here we go again. By then they had given up on the run. So you had to get to Unitas if you were serious about winning the game. I just took off every step and everything you did it was almost like you're not going to get there you're not going to get there and this fumble kills the hopes of the baltimore colts the packers are the western conference champions for 1966. it's been one of the most satisfying plays that i can remember I read in the paper the next day, it was the million dollar fumble. Well, I said, well, it was probably, if so, it was uh, orchestrated by a $10,000 player. <laughs> Davis was the hero of the game, but guard Fuzzy Thurston would be the star of the show on the team charter back to Wisconsin. And so that was a really exuberant airplane going back. And I don't remember many trips home, but I remember that one. The guys were very, very cheery. Then somebody would have a beer or two, or maybe something else that they had in their, in their knapsack. 
And then Fuzzy would start singing. He's got the whole world in his hands. And it would go through, you know, he's got the greatest quarterback in his hands. The whole plane was just, oh gosh, it was so energized and uh, pumped up as he's singing this song and leading everybody on the plane. Coach Lombardi's getting involved, everyone is. And then finally it would come to, we've got the greatest coach. And if you look around, everybody would be singing, even those of us that were skeptical. And I don't know that I've ever been in a situation flying back where there was more fun being displayed openly and to the level and degree that it was that night. It was very moving for everyone, and Coach Lombardi was thrilled. After winning the Western Conference in 1966, Green Bay needed only one playoff victory to gain a berth in the first Super Bowl. The 12 and 2 Packers arrived in Texas with a few surprises up their sleeve. The Dallas Cowboys were famous for several things, most notably studying statistics and tendencies. So that day, everything we had done from a specific formation was reversed. So that whatever they called out, we were going the other way. They knew our tendency was to run the ball strong and the Packers sweep was the most famous play we had. Lombardi threw it out, he threw it out of the game plan because he knew they would spend a lot of time preparing for that play. So why bother? Why not attack them in ways that they least suspect? And sure enough, we popped some big ones early, got it in the end zone, seven to nothing. Kick off, they fumble, Jim Grabowski picks it up, runs it in the end zone, it's 14 to nothing. As a young player, I thought, oh man, this is great. We got them, and that's the problem. This might've been the worst thing that could've happened to us. I don't care how mature you are as a team, it's impossible to really believe that Dallas could come back and get you. By golly, they did. That Dallas game probably was one of the most inept efforts. We didn't seem to play as smart, didn't cover people, missed assignments. Not a typical Green Bay kind of experience. We never played pack of football. And I know personally, I did not have a great game. Fortunately, Bart Starr did, throwing for more than 300 yards and four touchdowns. Starr pumps one, fires up the middle, the pass is complete to Boyd Dollar for the touchdown. And Dollar was belted hard in the end zone by Mike Gector. Boyd took a heck of a shot in the end zone and falls on his uh, shoulder, held onto the ball, typically a Boyd, made a great catch, and ultimately cost him a chance to continue into the Super Bowl a couple of weeks later. Because of that injury, he has to come out. I don't know why Mike Hector would let him run three steps in the end zone and then upend him. Our most combative guy on offense was Jimmy Taylor. The instant that Taylor starts looking for Gector, which could have very easily gotten him ejected, number 15 is right in Jimmy Taylor's face. And Bart is just guiding him all the way. And when he gets to the sideline, you listen carefully, you hear, out of way, Bart. The most underestimated aspect of Bart Starr is the fact that he's a great leader, tough as nails. Didn't say much, but when it was necessary, he did what had to be done. When Starr connected with Dollar's replacement, Max McGee, late in the game, Green Bay appeared to be in good shape. Don Meredith, who, who went cold for a long time in the fourth quarter, suddenly Frank Clark is running down the middle of the field and we bust the coverage. A long, long, long one, and it is complete to Frank Clark. And Clark takes it into the end zone with a touchdown. Now we're only up by seven. We go out, we can't move the ball, we have a short punt, and they're knocking on the door again. 
And the next thing we know, it's 34-27, and they're on our two. I remember I walked in the, the huddle, and I said, hey, guys, this is it. This is it. I said, we got to stop them now or regret the missed opportunities. This is it. If the Cowboys go in here and kick the extra point, we're going into overtime. They've got one play to travel two yards. Meredith takes the ball, rolls out to the right. He's going to be nailed. Think about that and how close Tom Landry came to being a winning coach. What is now called the Lombardi Trophy might be called something else had it not been for those key plays. Really, it might be the Landry Trophy. And the Packers have just taken the championship. A great goal line stand by the Packer defense. After beating the Cowboys for the NFL championship, the Packers savored one of the most exciting playoff wins of the Lombardi era. I think this is the biggest game and the best game I've ever watched or played in. I really do. We've had a, a lot of big ones, but none bigger than this. And I bet the fans, I don't know anybody that was ready to go home until it was over to you. <laughs> for the first time in league history, there would be one more game to play. In two weeks, the Packers would battle the Kansas City Chiefs in the inaugural Super Bowl. Who won it? Kansas City. On to Kansas City. Kansas City, here we come. As the dominant American Football League team of 1966, the Chiefs would be the AFL's representative in this first ever meeting between the two leagues. But the more established Packers were quickly tabbed as two touchdown favorites. We had almost nothing to gain because we were expected to win, but if, had we gotten knocked off, it would have been something we felt that we'd have had to live with for the rest of our lives. That first championship against the Chiefs in, in Los Angeles probably had more pressure on Coach Lombardi than any game, I think, ever. We didn't know he was getting telegrams from Wellington Mara saying you carry the honor and the integrity of the National Football League on your shoulders. We are counting on you. Be sure you do not let us down. And we're not allowed to lose. You cannot lose this game. But the closer we got to game day, the more intense he got. And it was the most anxious I ever saw him. I mean, we really thought he might have a heart attack. After arriving in Los Angeles, Lombardi raised curfew fines to $2,500, then added a grim warning. He said, oh, and there's one other thing I want you to understand. If you break curfew, you'll never play another league game in the National Football League. I promise I'll personally see to it. Lombardi's threats didn't bother backup receiver Max McGee who had teamed often with his pal Paul Horning at late night carousing. They were roommates on the road, and they were something else. Coach Lombardi, when he discovered that these guys were just, they were going to be out, they were going to violate curfew, he just fined the heck out of them. They paid with their fines. They paid for our team party every year, and that's a fact. I've a lot of broads between 8 and 11 because that's the only time we get off. But I'm a bitch after the curfew check, because I sneak out every <laughs> night. I did not believe that even McGee had the audacity to slip out after Lombardi made his speech that afternoon before the game. I didn't think even Max could do it. Assuming his playing time would be limited, Fun-loving McGee took full advantage of the Hollywood nightlife. And here we are in the first Super Bowl game. And when I go down at 6.30 in the morning to pick up a paper on game day, off to my left front entrance of the hotel, I see Max McGee coming through the front door. 
He's coming through at 6.30 in the morning. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this man's been out all night on the eve of the biggest game in our career. Thousands of people here in the stands, and there are millions of people on television, and everyone looking, and all with speculation, to see what kind of a game the Green Bay Packers are going to play today. Right? Right. right? right. I want you to be proud of your profession. It's a great profession. You be proud of this game, and you can do a great deal for football today. Great deal for all the players and the league and everything else. Go out there and play this ball game like I know you can play it. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Get out there! Run out there! Lombardi's pregame attempts to inspire his team had achieved the opposite effect. He made us so cautious that in the first half, we literally played, making sure we didn't make a mistake. When you're concerned and you're so intimidated by the situation, uh, th then sometimes it takes away the, the real heart of what you do. We were tight. I and mean, anybody would have been tight in that situation. But also, Kansas City was really good. I mean, they had some great, great football players. In the early going, we didn't protect the passer well. Bart got hit. He got hit by my man, I know that. Starr wasn't the only Packer on the turf. When Boyd Dowler re-injured his shoulder, his sleep-deprived and hungover replacement was sent in. Now we have our first sub of the game. Dowler is going out, and Max McGee now is coming in as flanker. Well, when Boyd goes down, I said, uh-oh. Well, this is the very thing I was concerned about. And the flip side of that, though, based on his ability to be a clutch performer when called upon, I just had a gut feeling that Max would be ready, and he was. He steps in, and he plays like gangbusters. Dale to the right, McGee to the left, star dropping straight back. In as he throws, has the ball, and McGee And the old veteran scores the first touchdown of the Super Bowl game. Despite McGee's unexpected heroics, the Chiefs kept the game close. The Packers had seen enough. In the third quarter, Lombardi turned the dogs loose on defense. We definitely had more aggressive play calls in the, in the second half. And that was what, to me, created the turning point. Dawson being rushed and thrown. Chiefs were held scoreless for the rest of Super Bowl I, and Max McGee couldn't be stopped. Max has announced to anybody that would listen, hey, I can kill these guys if I get in this game. He goes out and proceeds to have an MVP-type performance. Sharp looks, has time, goes in the end zone. With a mixture of satisfaction and relief, the now relaxed Packer bench could enjoy their Super Bowl win along with their unflappable team. What a day! It's the stuff of legend, and it should be. And Bart got the most valuable player because he earned it, but they probably should have split it and had co-MVPs because Max had that great a game. Bart, it's a real pleasure to present you keys to this car for your wonderful performance in the Super Bowl. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Al, I'm extremely delighted to be able to receive this car, and I, if I could be permitted, I'd like to receive it in the name of the entire Green Bay Packer team. We donated it to a boy's home that we had co-founded uh, some years ago, and so we didn't really get a chance to drive the car that much, but Max could have easily been the most valuable player in that Super Bowl. Lost in the moment was McGee's roommate, Paul Horning, the only Packer not to appear in Super Bowl I coach went over and said to Paul, would you like to go in for a play or two? And Paul said, no, nah, let's don't do that, coach. Let's just, this is fine. I'm just happy to be here on the sideline. The following spring during the New Orleans Saints expansion draft, Vince Lombardi endured one of the most painful moments of his coaching career. He called me in his office, and he was obviously emotional right from the beginning. And he said, 
You know, I've just had one of the most devastating things to happen to me ever. Paul Horning is going to New Orleans. And he said, I tell you, it's the last thing I would have wanted is Paul to leave the Green Bay Packers. And he said, Willie, that's a guy that I have loved like a son. Horning shoulder injuries kept him on the sidelines. He never played a single down for New Orleans and retired that summer. But another Packer runner did eventually suit up for the Saints. The disgruntled Jim Taylor left Green Bay for good and finally got the big payday he'd been looking for. From Louisiana State There was still one more Packer who, albeit reluctantly, was heading to New Orleans. Coach called and said, look, I had two centers, so I had to put you both on there. They claimed you. I took it as a personal affront that he had placed me on the expansion list. I couldn't face the fact that maybe it was because I, I wasn't a very good football player. I see now that that was the case. And yet somehow it was a shattering emotional thing to me. And I just sat down on the floor and sobbed. But the most obvious thing about the 66 Packer team is that we won the very first Super Bowl and endured a kind of scrutiny and pressure that no other team since then has ever had to endure. It was a, a magnificent opportunity for us, representing the prestigious National Football League with its great history and tradition. That was satisfying to all of us, and I, and I think maybe to Coach Lombardi as much as anything, because he had been accomplished almost everything that could be accomplished at Green Bay. I think it was a great achievement, and I think real football people will always appreciate that, appreciate the job that Bart Starr did, and the job that that great defense with Willie Davis and Ray Nitschke and others did in that game, and that that team, for those reasons, will be remembered as one of the great teams of all time.